Thank you, y'all may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it was just over a year ago when I had the honor to uh, meet with this distinguished team that uh, we have in front of the people of North Carolina. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you to each one of you for your dedication to public service and your dedication to North Carolina. Um, I said three or four things to these people when they agreed to join our cabinet team. The first one and most important thing to me was their ethic, ethical standards. And I'm very proud of the ethical standards that they displayed during this first year in office. The second thing that I asked of them was teamwork. That they would be a team working on behalf of North Carolina and not thinking silos. And I'm just proud that each one of them have provided resources to each other, guidance to each other, and um, we haven't set up an organization composed of a lot of turf but we are a team working together for both the long-term success of North Carolina. The other thing that I mentioned to them was the problem solvers. We all came in here with some serious issues that we had to face immediately in North Carolina, and I asked them not to just come to me with the problems, but also come to me with solutions. And they have done just that, and they continue to do that every day. This group has been meeting once a week for one year now. In fact, we had another meeting this morning. We usually meet for an hour and a half to two hours every week to discuss operational issues and policy issues and issues of where we want to take the state with our legislative leaders and with the people of North Carolina during the next four years. And um, we're going to continue to have those meetings. So we continue to work together as a team and find viable solutions to some of the complex issues our state and our nation are facing. When they came here a year ago, we were facing some serious issues. One is we had the fifth highest unemployment rate in the country, at 9.5%. We had more than 450,000 people out of work in North Carolina. We had 41 counties with over 10% unemployment. We had a $2.5 billion debt that businesses owed the federal government, and we had Medicaid forecasts that were off, and we were soon to find out off by over $500 million. We had an antiquated tax code that was not competitive with our neighboring states and was not competitive in both recruiting and retaining businesses in North Carolina. The list goes on and on. But we volunteered for this job and we agreed to find solutions to these very difficult issues. We also had to make some immediate decisions within a very tough period of time along with our legislative leaders. With collaboration of the House and Senate, we made necessary changes to the unemployment benefits aimed at paying off our debt and getting off the credit card to the federal government and getting people back to work. We said no initially to expanding Medicaid under Obamacare because we believe we need to first fix the system to make sure children, the disabled, the women, the elderly, and the poor are getting the services they need in North Carolina. We also initiated tax reform with our legislative leaders in which we lowered the income tax rate from 7.75% with our ultimate goal of 5.8% and lowered the corporate tax rate from 6.9% to 6.5% in 2015. We closed loopholes, tax loopholes on many businesses including newspapers, movies, and other items throughout North Carolina. We also initiated, as we promised, transportation reform to make sure we get a bigger bang for our dollar and with limited dollars to spend to improve our infrastructure and to expand our transportation infrastructure in North Carolina. And we also began the implementation of commerce reform to provide better customer service for those businesses that want to expand in North Carolina or move to North Carolina. Now, we've had some very good results, especially in the last three months, just by statistics alone. But our work has not ended, and we cannot take those results for granted because we want our solutions to be long-term and sustainable. But we're very proud that the Washington Post recently named North Carolina one of the nine states that won, and right now we have 7.4% unemployment rate. But we want it to go lower, and we also understand there could be fluctuations. 
Our solutions are for the long term, not the short term. Our debt is now to be paid off in 2015. This is business debt owed to the federal government, which is three years ahead of schedule, a sharp contrast in North Carolina's employment situation before and after we made this decision on unemployment benefits. North Carolina's employment figure lost 44,270 jobs from January to uh, July, and now North Carolina's employment figure gained 35,850 jobs July through November. We hope that in the very near future, for the first time in five years, North Carolina will see a net job gain. That's our goal. State government is spending less and taking in more. Through the first five months of the fiscal year beginning July 1st, collections were ahead of revenue expectations by $19.7 million. This is $213 million ahead of where we were at the same time last year. And through the first five months of the fiscal year beginning July 1, expenditures were $92 million below where we were at the same time last year. This means the unreserved fund balance is $221.8 million above where we were at the same time last year. Now we're already getting great feedback on tax reform and other initiatives that we um, put into practice. But we have a lot of work to do. And these financial numbers look good in the short term, but we still have concern about other financial numbers that could come in in the future. What I'd like to do today, which I think is unique in North Carolina's history, is to have not only myself, but my cabinet help communicate to the people of North Carolina about our goals for next year. And what I'd like to do is talk about some of our goals and some of the initiatives that we hope to continue to, to implement through the upcoming year, and then take questions from members of the media. The number one priority continues to be our economy. And our goal is in several areas that we did not accomplish during our first year. The one is, is powering the economy through energy exploration. While we've had recent success in our economy, one thing that is going to really drive our recovery and renaissance in North Carolina is getting into the energy business. I said this when I ran in 2008. I said it again when I ran in 2012. We're 10 years behind in this effort, and we need to begin that process as soon as possible. So John Scavaro, my Dean of Secretary, is going to be leading the effort with the legislature to begin and implement more energy legislation during the short session so we can begin finding out what's out there through seismic testing offshore and also through testing of potential inland resources in North Carolina counties. Now, I was very lucky to uh, have the presence here last week on the runway to talk about getting North Carolina in the energy business. And I'm going to be proud to join and be chairman of the Governor's Outer Continental Shelf Coalition in the very near future, as I'm currently serving as the uh, te temporarily taking the place of the Alaskan governor right now, who has asked me to be the full time chairman of that group. Um, I expect more cooperation with the federal government and the president, and I hope to meet with the uh, energy secretary in February, along with other governors so we can start the process to help unleash the resources underneath our grounds and ocean here in North Carolina. The other thing that we want to continue to work on through the leadership of Secretary Tony Tata is our transportation uh, vision, which is called moving people and moving products. And this is throughout North Carolina, the east, the west, the Piedmont, the rural and urban areas of our great state. North Carolina is the fourth fastest growing state in the nation, and we will continue to grow. In fact, within the very near future, we will be the ninth most populated state in the nation. By an estimated 1.3 million people are going to come to our state over the next 10 years. A long-term, 25-year vision on moving people and moving products will be a key strategy to succeed. We will need to show people our vision for investing in better connections, expanding opportunities, and strengthening our economy through roads, rail, and ports. Our transportation vision will be focused on moving people and moving products through an innovative, multimodal approach. The vision will identify a set of objectives that will focus on leveraging transportation needs and assets to grow the economy in urban and especially rural areas of North Carolina. Secretary Taylor, I look forward to working with you and other members of the Cabinet in implementing this and with our state legislature who have been 
great partners, both Republicans and Democrats, in getting us to the first step of having the mobility formula. There is one unique program that will also be announcing more details in the, new, in the near future, which Secretary Susan Klutz is going to be working on, and this is a program which is called Art That Moves You. Why not make North Carolina a bit more beautiful as we travel across this beautiful, beautiful state? We will focus on art and transportation for art that moves you. We're going to promote tourism, the creative landscape, art and lighting along our highways, bridges, and border gateways. We think this is a unique opportunity, kind of following up on the great First Lady Dottie Martin, where she planted beautiful uh, flowers in the middle of our uh, great highways in North Carolina. We think there's a great way to have a beautification project of the hardened infrastructure that often distracts the visual beauty of North Carolina. Another major area of our economy which we've been working on and must continue to put uh, emphasis on is both protecting and promoting our military. First, we're going to put major emphasis on um, protecting the over $30 billion that the military provides for a state's gross product. And we need to do everything we can to protect the military installations. My uh, military advisor, Cordell Wilson, and my veterans uh, affairs advisor, Valerio Pantano, are focusing on these efforts. We've already had two trips to D.C. We're meeting with both federal officials and uh, congressional officials and Pentagon officials to make sure we meet two goals. One is to protect our military bases, and the second is to use the military personnel and help the military personnel that are returning home from Iraq and Afghanistan and place them in jobs right here in North Carolina and use them as a recruitment tool of needed labor, which many businesses are looking for right now to either grow or move to North Carolina. We look forward to working with our military leaders and my staff and the legislature in, in this great new initiative here in North Carolina. Now, another major area of focus will continue to be education. In North Carolina. We made some progress. I'm very pleased with the first bill we signed was the Vocational Career Path Bill, which understands that we also need to have a vocational trained workforce in North Carolina to meet the labor needs. But we have some work to do, especially with regards to teacher compensation. Teachers in North Carolina had one raise in the last five or six years, and that is unacceptable to me and unacceptable to the legislature and unacceptable to the people of North Carolina. And that's why we will get teacher raises done this year. We can't just put a band-aid on teacher pay raise. We will focus on newcomers to the profession and raise starting pay to attract people to the classroom. We need to think strategically and long-term, which includes taking a market-based approach that will reward our best teachers and those that are in demand. Our plan will go beyond this short session to offer results, rewards, and respect for students, parents, and teachers. I've directed our senior education advisor, Eric McCann, to work closely with the House and Senate on mapping our educational goals, and we have to hope to have those goals in agreement with both the Senate and the House within a very short period of time. And we're having very, very positive dialogue with those Senate and House leaders at this point in time. Another initiative that uh, goes along with what I initiated in our State of the State Address uh, back in February of last year was dealing with the issue of addiction. This is an issue that is destroying communities and destroying families. And there's one area where we need to concentrate on because we have a responsibility to protect our students on college campuses that the state owns and operates. We will be initiating a Campus Anti-Substance Abuse Initiative, an anti-underage drinking initiative to help protect our students and protect their future. Across the country, 600,000 college students are injured or killed in alcohol or drug-related accidents each year. If we lose one student to binge drinking or drugs, that's one too many. In addition, we often lose these students later on in life because of the addiction or mental health issues that are, that are um, completely directed or related to this early drinking. The initiative will focus on reducing underage drinking on college campuses, and for those who face drug or alcohol addiction, we must provide and will provide recovery support services. Young people at our state universities are responsible, 
and they're our responsibility also. They're on our property, and their parents expect us to keep them safe. Our Department of Public Safety Secretary Frank Perry and our ABC Commission Chairman Jim Gardner are leading this effort. We'll announce more details in the very near future. Now, one area that I've talked about often when I came to the governor's office was this, is that not all of what happens here in Raleigh is about policy and politics. Actually, one of our greatest challenges is the operations of state governments and the execution of policy. It continues to be one of our great challenges. And we have several areas where we're going to be emphasizing the efficiency of state government. The first is putting patients first regarding Medicaid reform. We want a Medicaid system that prioritizes patients and treats the whole person, looking out for people's mental and physical health care needs. We want a Medicaid system that delivers the right care at the right place at the right time. And our Medicaid system must reward providers for healthy outcomes for their patients, not just for the services they list on a bill. And lastly, we want a partnership for a healthy North Carolina that builds on what is already working in the state. Secretary Aldona Balls has already gathered tons of feedback from listening to us and meetings with recipients and advocates and providers and healthcare executives and lawmakers and will continue to lead that effort. The other area that uh, I put a major priority to Secretary Tata was customer service as it relates to DMV modern modernization. We've been testing out a lot of things in DMV during the past six months. In fact, in just the few tests that we've had in North Charlotte, Cary, we've um, We've added greeters, direct customers. We've tested some kiosks for walk-up services. We've added 19 driver's license offices, spending evening and Saturday hours for more customer services. We're testing a lot of things that do work and maybe some things that haven't worked. We hope to anticipate a rollout, uh, to implement a rollout program for the entire state for good customer service and DMV. Uh, based upon some of these tests. And Secretary Tate has got a big responsibility on his hand to make this work, along with my good friend Nick Tennyson, who's uh, our direct deputy secretary in that area. Another new project that we're working on, that um, we've been actually working on for the past six months, is an initiative that we're calling Rebuilding North Carolina. This is an extensive state capital um, review project of all property and buildings that are currently owned by the state of North Carolina. And I'm telling you right now, I received some criticism from state employees about the condition of some of our buildings, some of the unsafe conditions, some of the unhealthy conditions, and frankly, some of the unproductivity um, uh, issues that we're dealing in our buildings right now. And talking to Secretary Daltridge and Secretary Scalarla, Scalar, they have uh, given me information which says that uh, we've got some very serious cost issues, maintenance issues, and repair issues. We need a long-term solution. So what we're going to be doing is implementing a new process which includes workpl workplace safety, health issues, personal well-being, and work productivity, and make sure that we have the buildings necessary that uh, treat our employees in the right way, and that reward productivity and increase productivity in state government and also reduce the cost to taxpayers. We'll be presenting this plan to the state legislature hopefully by the second quarter of this year. Another major pro uh, issue that we're dealing with efficiency is a program that we announced early in the year and that's NC Gear, North Carolina Government Efficiency and Reform. This project is a review of policy, personnel, and organizations of all government agencies to make it work better for the people of North Carolina. Now, one of the major initiatives in a very short period of time will be doing a major review of DHHS. In fact, as I look at DHHS, we're asking the question, is it too big to succeed? We will look at these operations, we will look at the organizations, and we will look at the policies which are impacting not only the operations of DHHS, but the operations and potential inefficiencies of other departments. This is going to be a major priority in which the whole team will be assisting each other in this effort and will also be asking for outside expertise. There is a, uh, uh, urgency in this issue because of the amount of money that it's costing us, 
and some of the problems and mistakes that have been made, not just this past year, but during the past five years. Again, our goal here is to identify opportunities for improving services and saving money. The entire team will be working on this effort with our Pope's leadership and trying to uh, look at where we can improve in all of our departments. Another major issue we're working on is work, workers' comp reform, working for workplace safety. Initial review during the past two months has shown us that workmen's comp costs are excessive and need to be aggressively managed here in North Carolina. This is money that we could be spending on teachers or on education or roads. A large a part of these costs are open cases, over 4,000 open cases right now. So we plan to look into each one and our goal is to get employees back to work and help those employees that are currently injured. Our goal is to reduce injuries and reduce costs. Neil Alexander, uh, our Office of State Human Resources uh, Director, is focusing on this very much important issue on making uh, every department a safer workplace and reducing the cost to taxpayers. If state employees recognize hazards, um, we need to fix it, and we need to reduce the cost to our taxpayers and move that money to other areas of higher authority. The last thing I want to talk about regarding the goals of this team is performance management. One thing we noticed when we got here is that we had no consistent performance management system for all state employees uh, throughout North Carolina. The most productive state workers have a say in their job and their goals, and that is our goal. So for the first time in state government, our human resource team is implementing a consistent performance management system. We're going to use technology to increase efficiency and engage employees. Diener, under the leadership of John Scavarla, has already piloted this project and will continue to make small adjustments based on that pilot, but our goal is to implement this program across all agencies in North Carolina. Now, I've got to mention one other goal. And it's the first lady's goal. Now she's going to continue to work with military families. Uh, I'm so proud of Anna McCrory because uh, she's brought military families and their kids to, to uh, this mansion on many occasions. She didn't invite the press because she went through everything she could to show them that we care for these families while their loved ones are overseas. And she's going to continue to make that a major priority. But there's another priority that she has uh, let the public know, and that is she loves pets and dogs. And she wants the Pepe Protection Program and the law passed, and so do I. We will work to pass this legislation which requires humane treatment and basic standards for large commercial dog breeders. It is not too much to ask dog breeders to provide basic food and water, sufficient space, regular exercise, and routine veterinarian care for their dogs and puppies. North Carolina currently has no laws regulating commercial breeders unless they sell to research labs or to pet stores. Without adequate regulation, North Carolina will continue to allow puppy mills to operate. And the first lady doesn't want that either the line. We've got some major challenges and some major goals, and we've got a lot of hard work. But um, I think I've got a great team to make that happen, and I've got some great legislative leaders, both on the Republican and Democratic side, that we're going to work together with. I'm going to continue to work with our legislative leaders in the federal government. I'm going to work with the White House in helping us meet some of these objectives. This is a team effort, and it's going to take a team, including all the citizens of North Carolina, to continue to, to continue the next chapter of the Carolina comeback. With that, uh, we welcome any questions. I'm going, to, I'm going to have you ask me the questions, and then if I need assistance from my cabinet members, which I know I will, I'll have them uh, participate in this question and answer uh, session. I hope uh, you like this both uh, this unique format, uh, probably the first time in North Carolina history that I know of, where the governor and the entire cabinet have uh, held a press conference. So with that, uh, let me take some questions. Yes, sir, John. And governor. if you could introduce yourself and also who you represent, I appreciate it. Sure, of course. John Frank from News and Observer. Governor, will you commit to increasing teacher pay to the national average this session? I'm not going to put any specific figure on that at this point in time, but my goal is to make it competitive and make it a pay that is respectful not only for the short, short term, but the long term. Um, I've got to Eric Buchanan right here. In fact, Eric, if you pull up your chair, I'll be glad to uh, 
if you want to talk about that process a little bit about what we're going through. Eric, come on up and follow the mic. Yeah, as, as Governor McCrory said, the, the thing that we really want to focus on is to ensure that the teaching profession is a destination and not a layover, and that uh, we have a long-term profession um, in place for our teachers. We are falling behind other states, and uh, it's going to be really important that we focus on this issue, as the governor said, not just for the short term, but for the long term. And we are in discussions right now with our legislative leaders and hoping to get agreement very similar to what we did with the mobility formula. I expect this to be a team effort. And, uh, I look forward to those ongoing discussions and roll out. Yes, sir. Uh, John Camp, ABC 11. Governor, you said, Welcome, John. Thank you. You said uh, off the top that you said no initially to expanding Medicare, uh, Medicaid, Medicaid. Medicaid, excuse me. Uh, by saying initially, are you thinking about changing that? Or are we going to expand At Medicaid? At this time, no, but I keep the door open for all options in the future. Um, but my goal is to initially fix the existing system, and the existing system is not fixed at this point in time. And uh, I'm always up to reevaluating uh, decisions in the past and deciding what's best in the future, but right now, um, that's not in the cards. But uh, we'll see how things change, and, and I think we're going to go through a lot of lessons learned with the implementation of Obamacare uh, this coming year. I do think we made the right decision at this point in time based upon the uh, issues that are occurring throughout the nation and in other states on the bottom here. Yes, ma'am. Governor Laura Leslie, WRAL. Welcome, Laura. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, you. You asked the question, is DHHS too big to succeed? A really interesting question. What What are you envisioning or what kind of possibilities are you seeing as a, as a way to get a handle on that? I don't have a, a, a solution. That's why I'm going to have a team to review. You know, it's, it's kind of amazing. Uh, Dr. Boss, throughout the year, um, it's, it's just amazing how much is on one organization's plate. In fact, I think that's one reason. We, I think we've had five secretaries in six years. There's maybe a reason for that. And, uh, you know, I've, from day one, I remember my, one of my first phone calls from Secretary Boss in, in a late night phone call was the tragedy that happened in Boone, uh, which the state is still dealing with and those families are still dealing with. I remember getting another phone call where a senior citizens uh, center was closed down in the dead of winter <coughs> at night time. She had to make that call. This weekend, I got a call from Secretary Boss about a fire at a nuclear plant facility. Then, of course, three or uh, several weeks ago, we got a call about the computer, the mailing breakdown. I mean, it's just the, the variance of issues that uh, what organization is having to deal with is, um, I think, uh, needs review. And um, I think just by looking at uh, how much turnover we've had in that one department is maybe a signal that we don't not just do a, re a quick review of that department, but there are other departments that we need to look at uh, the organizational structure, the policies, and um, and uh, the budgets of many of these departments. And I, I, I might say it's not just the size of the department. We have many restrictive policies that don't allow our secretaries to make immediate moves to to fix problems. And these are some civil service rules that are in place, some political rules that are in place. Um, we even have a policy that. You know, don't allow us to transfer employees over a 35-mile radius. Um, these are very limiting that you don't see in the private sector, but we have them in government. Uh, the list goes on and on and on, and it basically ties the hands of many of these uh, these cabinet directors. And um, we have uh, workforce development, part of workforce development in DHS. We have pre-K in DHS. We have um, some. Uh, other areas of the energy, energy areas, energy areas in DHS. It, it just, uh, it, it's just—it's an amazing um, hodgepodge of responsibilities that I think make management extremely difficult. And as the private sector would do, we need to look at that—not uh, just the reorganization, but also the policies and other issues that may be hindering fixing the problem. And we need to fix these problems.